in the spirit of reconciliation. Herbert Smith Freehills acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. A really um, productive development and um, I wouldn't say unexpected, but um, uh, very, very positive for both sides of the equation because I think we have restored a sense of balance to this. This is litigation which is now viewed on its merits on an each and every case basis, as opposed to the automatic reaction being, this needs to be settled. Welcome to On Just Terms. In this series, we look at the changing nature of corporate risk in Australia by speaking to the people at the front line of Australian litigation who will shape the future of the Australian legal risk landscape. In this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Kane Jackson of Watton and Carney and Paul O'Brien of WIPOL. Both are deeply experienced legal advisors to boards, directors and officers and their insurers. Kane leads Watton and Carney's financial lines practice and has extensive experience in high profile class actions, including a role in the first Australian securities class action to run to judgment. Like Kane, Paul brings expertise in class actions, having over 35 years experience in commercial and insurance litigation. Kane Jackson, Paul O'Brien, thank you so much for joining this episode of On Just Terms. We're really grateful for you devoting your time. My pleasure. Given how well we know each other, it feels a little artificial to be having the usual conversations that we have with the cameras rolling, but we knew that our audience would really benefit from your, your deep experiences in a number of markets, legal and other, and I wanted to start in, in this podcast series we're exploring the future trends in litigation in Australia. I wanted to start close to home, close to home for all of us. I know it goes without saying that we continue to see the growth of class action litigation in Australia. I would call it a steady growth, but that's sometimes considered controversial. It's probably a bit more than that. And that's had uh, impacts on a range of different markets. I think we've had two commissions, uh, the Australian Law Reform Commission most recently, look at the question of what impact it's having on, among other things, the DNO market. And you are closer to those markets than I'll ever be. And so I did want to ask you, each of you, to start off. Can you talk a little bit about the recent history of how the growth in class action litigation, I guess specifically shareholder claims, how that's impacted the insurance market? Dramatic, um, arguably catastrophic at some levels um, to the point where certain um, highly prominent DNO insurers have exited the market. That inevitably put a huge squeeze on capacity we had premiums um, increase exponentially and corporations having to make very, very difficult decisions about the scope and level of cover they were prepared to purchase and in some instances um, could actually purchase. Um, the biggest controversy and um, pain point, I suppose, is um, what we call side C cover, which is really um, cover for the corporation in response to a securities claim. Um, it's fair to say that Dino insurers were not prepared for um, what hit them in that mid-2015 or so in the 2010s. Um, it, was, um, it came on very quickly and it took a long time for insurers to grapple with what it meant, which um, resulted in um, decisions obviously to exit. Um, but also um, a lack of appetite for new players for a period. Um, the other aspect is the fact that boards um, and um, senior officers within organisations were suddenly talking about DNO in a way that they'd never had before. Very interested in um, the mechanics of DNO, what it's for, why side C is even there. So um, it's been... Um, it has been a huge jolt, um, but it has meant that DNO insurance suddenly has a, a place that I think it should occupy, and that is front and centre in terms of um, risk management for corporations and um, insurers who 
have a deep understanding of the product they're now issuing, um, when the same may not have been um, able to be said, uh, you know, six, seven years ago. Um, that's probably reflected in the fact that we have those those exits. Paul, from your vantage point, is that is that consistent with what you're seeing? Uh, yes, it is, Jason, and I'd I'd agree with um, everything that Kane was just putting. Um, you talk about the impact on the DNO uh, market, um, and that inevitably sort of leads you to a, a question about or a consideration of pricing. Um, and I should say at the outset that I'm not an insurance broker and I'm not an insurance underwriter. So what I know about pricing is more anecdotal um, you know, for the, the matters and claims that come across my desk as a, um, a solicitor acting for insurers and, and sometimes for insureds in, in DNO. Um, and for what I read and for, I guess, just general market gossip. But it does seem to be the case that from about 200, uh, 2017 onwards, um, there's been a dramatic increase in the price of DNO um, insurance. Um, and that increased even more so with COVID in 20 uh, and 21. But there does seem to be a general view that that's peaked. Uh, and it, 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 for many insureds, but not all, because it's not uniform. And in most categories of DNO, but not, I think, for side C cover. So side C cover, I think the prices have continued to go up. And I was reading a report the other day that Aon have issued for Q2 uh, 2022, where they were saying that 29% of their ASX 100 um, uh, clients were not taking out side C cover at all, which is an interesting and perhaps slightly alarming um, piece of data. Can I pick that point up, Paul, uh, in two regards? One is I'd be interested in both of your views on is there likely to be a stabilising of the, the DNO market, in particular the side C uh, aspect of that, given what you've just said, as we get a little bit more certainty around what the law says the relevant obligations are on directors and officers and listed Australian entities in, the, in, in some aspects of shareholder class action uh, normative law. Uh, and also, if you, if you can hold that thought and also think about this question, uh, the, the decision not to take side C, I'd be very interested to get your sense of the risks that, and I know the audience will be interested in, the risks that that might trigger for listed entities. I, I've heard questions asked of me, and I've got a view, but I'll, I'll defer to the experts about whether that makes listed entities more or less of a target for shareholder class action litigation. So we might touch on that as well, but maybe starting with the first part, are we moving into a period of more stabilisation, even price stabilisation, even with side C? Well, Jason, that does seem to be the, I guess, you know, the market um, information. Uh, and it, it seems to me that, you know, these are markets, um, it's about supply and demand. So um, I think when, um, when, when the price is right, I think we'll get a stabilisation. Um, and uh, yeah, my understanding is the premium pool for, um, for DNO in Australia is now about $1.2 billion annually. And that's an increase of about 300 to 400% um, over the past um, three to four years. Um, and I think with, with that level of, of premium, um, then I think that is attracting new entrants. Uh, and it also means that insurers are, are starting to price the risk uh, better, which I think was one of Kane's points. I think some of them didn't understand the product and they didn't understand the risks. And there has been a big explosion in class action claims, particularly securities class action claims. Um, but it's a matter of pricing. And when that's right, one would hope that markets will do what markets always do and we'll, and we'll, get, um, we'll get some stability. Kane, your sense of the stability question? Yeah, I think um, certainly the short to medium term, because um, there's a few factors at play. One is new entrants. Um, we've seen a, <clears throat> a real change in profile. So um, Dino Insurance historically, um, local market, Lloyds, syndicates. The non-Lloyds um, international insurer contingent now um, has a real appetite, um, which creates options. I mean, Paul's point around pricing and premium pool is, is correct. And these new players also don't have the scars of having um, their, their balance sheets battered by um, historical or legacy claims. Um, the, other, the other two issues I think which are important in terms of price stabilisation is um, 
we are at historically low levels of insolvencies. Um, DNO insurance um, is uh, a dominant feature of DNO insurance is protecting directors against insolvency. In this sense, um, once a company goes bust, um, one of the first ports of call will be the directors. There'll be a heavy scrutiny about decisions. We're at something like 50% of pre-pandemic levels. So this isn't just about the side C bit, it's about the fact that um, the economic factors at the moment and the low level of claims as a result of low level insolvencies means that this is a more attractive market. Um, the other feature is, um, although securities class actions continue to be a prominent feature of the class action landscape, there hasn't been that anticipated sort of exponential growth. So um, if we were having this discussion in 2018, I think we all would be saying there would be a doubling, if not more, in terms of class action activity. That hasn't happened. That's been accompanied by, I think, a sense of, um, I wouldn't say comfort is the wrong word, but um, I suppose a pragmatism around the fact that this is a feature of our environment now, but it's not a runaway train. The other part is that um, there's a comfort level or a sophistication around what we are actually now dealing with. Um, this means that um, insurers understand um, how to run these claims. They have a better feel for the legal advisors in that space. They understand the judges better. They understand the process. So I think all those factors mean that um, there probably will be or there should be a stabilisation. Anything changes, though, particularly in the insolvency space, um, or there is an unexpected spike in class actions, you can expect Dino insurers to be super sensitive to that because, again, it's, it's recent history um, in terms of bad claims experience and um, evidence of what it can do when you, when you, you know, what can happen when you get it wrong. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and so perhaps relatedly, I know it'll be multifactorial, but this decision, a quick comment on this decision that you're observing at some, in some boards not to take side C cover, is it a hangover from a very dislocated market? It is, is it a um, greater level of certainty that they understand what the landscape is and where the risks lie? Is it none of those things? Uh, just a quick comment on what's driving that trend from each of you. There's a few factors for me. One is um, the, the mid to small cap, still find it hard to get it. <laughs> and um, you know, pricing is a massive issue. At the other end of the spectrum, um, the larger entities can afford to absorb that risk. Um, so protecting the balance sheet is not, um, it, it's not as significant an issue. Um, I don't like the theory that if you don't buy side C, you won't be the subject of a claim. I think that's nonsense. In fact, it shouldn't come into the equation at all. Um, the other factor I think is um, a, a philosophical view of where DNO insurance should sit. Is it just for the benefit of the directors? or should the company drive um, some direct benefit from it? Um, and if there is to be the direct benefit, um, how do we preserve that policy for the benefit of insurers? And I think that that dynamic has shifted a bit, which has meant that side C's become you know, less significant. Yeah, I'd agree with, uh, with what Kane said on that. Um, last year, I was asked to advise the board of a listed company that was considering this issue, do we take out side C or don't we? And um, my view, rightly or wrongly, for better or worse, was that um, if you can afford to buy the product, I think you should buy the product. And I'd have concerns if listed entities didn't buy side C, um, provided they could afford you know, to purchase it. Um, and um, one concern is that, in, as you'd know, um, Jason, you know, in Australia, we don't have uh, yet, fortunately, a tradition of um, directors and officers being routinely sued in securities class action claims, um, except in situations of, say, insolvency. Um, otherwise, the, you know, the target of the claim is the entity. And um, I don't think it would be good for corporate Australia for directors and officers to find themselves routinely the subject of a securities class action claim. I think that would make it difficult for a whole host of reasons um, for people to find that they're personally sued, even if they've got insurance there. Um, and uh, secondly, this idea of um, of, of, of listed entities that can afford it, simply taking uh, the risk to the balance sheet, I think um, uh, exposes um, uh, the boards of those companies that make those decisions to the risk that other shareholders will be unhappy 
that the balance sheet's been exposed when there's a product that could um, could, could purchase that risk um, and could take that risk off the entity. So for those reasons, I've got concerns about it, but I can understand it's a commercial decision. Uh, and if the price is too too high, um, and if the entity's not large enough to afford it, then there's no option. You raise an excellent point. Uh, one concern at the board level, of course, is if I don't take the, the side C, am I exposing myself to some liability? And, and I know that's a complicated question, certainly not a fait accompli that they are, but it just shows the layers of legal consideration and commercial that overlap here. Before I pivot away from my favourite topic of class actions, let me just ask one related question. We all know uh, that one jurisdiction, Victoria, has now embraced contingency fee, traditional what I call US style contingency fees, group costs orders. And it's unsurprising, but interesting to observe that the, the claim that most of the recent shareholder class action claims commenced in Australia have been commenced in Victoria to avail the promoters of the claim of the contingency fee, the laws developing as to how the contingency fee will be set, but it feels like we've got it now in that jurisdiction at least. And I think uh, Attorney General Dreyfus is, is considering uh, whether there should be a, a national uh, contingency fee for class actions in this country. That's a long introduction to a shorter question, which is in your own practices and experiences, are you, are you seeing a new risk frontier develop in Victoria as a result of the introduction of contingency fees in this space or, or what's your observation about what that decision might mean for the future? I had a strong view that it would increase the number of class actions, um, clearly in Victoria, but um, you know, as a whole. Um, I think I'm wrong in the short term in the sense that if you look at the last 18 months in terms of class actions issued in Victoria versus um, federally in particular, it does seem as if um, cases that may have been issued in New South Wales Supreme Court have ended up in the Victorian Supreme Court as opposed to there being additional cases. You factor in um, COVID-19 Victorian class action cases, which so inflate the figures a bit. Um, you look at the fact that the federal court still dominates two thirds of, of all cases. Um, I, I do think though that um, this is a process which will take some time. Um, the US experience says that lawyers will bring an entrepreneurial flair to this, which can only create a scenario where more claims are looked at more often and more risk is taken um, to um, you know, run cases on a contingent basis. So I think long term, it means more claims. Um, but at the moment, it has been interesting seeing the fact that it hasn't necessarily played out in that same way, particularly where um, if you look at cases at the moment, uh, you know, these class actions where group cost orders have been sought, litigation funders continue to feature heavily in that environment. This is not lawyers going, al going it alone. So um, it will take some time to, to bear out, I think. Paul, what's your sense? Yeah, again, I'd, I'd agree with um, Kane's comments. Uh, I think it will take some time. Um, for the ramifications um, of con the availability of con contingency fees in Victoria, you know, to play its way out. Um, but, you know, so for example, I'm advising on about eight or so uh, class action claims arising out of the Royal Commission. They're not securities class action claims, but they're financial institution um, class action claims. And uh, the vast majority of those uh, have been commenced in Victoria. Um, uh, uh, either in the Supreme Court of Victoria or in the, um, you know, the Victorian division um, of the federal court. And so that seems to be you know, a pronounced trend at the moment. Okay. I was going to say, there's, there's, there's a couple of other features. One, that Victoria, there is more certainty around the class closure process. So we've been in a quite uncertain environment there, which I think that, that probably informs the process. The other issue is that um, the fact that there is, I think, a consensus that more claims uh, are likely in a contingency fee environment it means that federally um, it's the, the access to justice argument which is going to fuel <laughs> the acceptance that that is probably the way to go. Um, it's a completely other debate, a, you know, a new debate, but um, there are, there's ultimately got to be a balancing. Someone's got to pay. <laughs> so the commercial exercise versus the access to justice argument, I think, um, it will be interesting to see whether that's done at a quite sophisticated and deep level or there's simply an acceptance that access to justice prevails and therefore um, contingency fees should, 
should prevail across the country. We'll have to have the conversation in two or three years again, but it occurs to me that the the policy foundations for contingency fees were, were, were in one sense correct, that is, can we increase the diversity of cl class actions in the areas that funders aren't pursuing? But it's pretty obvious, at least in this early stage, that all of the contingency fees are being sought in shareholder claims where we didn't exactly have an undersupply of class action services. So you're, you're, you're both right with respect, we'll need to continue this discussion in a couple of years. Gentlemen, I promised to pivot from class actions, but I, I lied in this respect. It would be remiss of me not to ask one follow-up question, which is, again, I think close to our respective practices. I might start with you on this one, Paul. I think I'm observing um, a, a trend in, within corporate Australia, particularly within corporate defence Australia, who are responding to class action risk. There's a, it's not universal, but there's an appetite to defend reasonable claims to trial if necessary. We've had three uh, uh, class actions proceed to judgment, uh, Maya, Wally Parsons, Iluka. There is a hearing as we're recording this uh, against Brambles in the uh, federal court at the moment. Uh, there, that is a, an unusual development. Um, historically, 80% of these claims or something very close to that if they're funded are settling. Is that a trend? Is it anomalistic? Is it a reaction to you know, pushing back on this relatively profitable equation for class action promoters? How, how do you read that development, Paul? Yeah, I think yes to all those things, Jason. So in September uh, 2019, I was in Munich at the invitation of some um, US attorneys and we were presenting a seminar on uh, insurance law developments, including you know, class action developments. Um, in the States and in Australia. And one of the things I said to the, um, you know, the very informed um, German audience um, was that in Australia, um, we had no case law on substantive um, securities class action issues. We had a lot of case law on procedural, important procedural points, but no case law on substantive issues. And then um, no sooner do I, I come home and the Meyer um, decision comes down and then we have Worley uh, in about February or March um, of the year later um, and uh, Aluka. Um, so um, I, I think that um, it was necessary for some cases to go to trial to establish what the substantive law was um, on a number of those areas. I don't think people um, ran those cases just to establish the law though. It's, it's a matter of whether or not, as you said in your um, introductory comments, it's, it's a matter of whether or not uh, the claims are reasonably and properly defended. Uh, and there are a number of claims which I think the insurance market um, has formed the view are reasonably and properly defended, and they have been defended with, um, with good results. Um, the, uh, the outcome of Worley was, was, uh, was particularly good, but then uh, disappointing with the appeal. And we know that the, the High Court will, will look at special leave on that. Um, but I think it's important for everybody in the insurance industry um, and for uh, everybody involved in corporate Australia, uh, directors and officers and corporates, um, to know what the rules are in this area. Cain, some, some, as, as Paul's alluded to, some first instance, at least, success for defendants at trial. Um, uh, will we see that continue in terms of a trend line? Yeah, we will. Um, I, I think there had to be a circuit breaker in terms of um, both insurer defendants and insurers um, taking a stand on the right case um, in circumstances where you know we'd had years of settling class actions and, and for good reason. Um, what it took though was um, corporations taking ownership of the liability issues and instead of leaning on insurer to solve the problem with money, um, there's been a far greater degree of collaboration and sort of collective ownership to say this is our problem, not this is your problem, your money, um, and we expect you to fix it. At the same time, I think there's been an unfortunate trend for those um, pursuing class actions in the security space to take on an ambit period, which um, means that these cases are far harder to settle and um, it, it can result in um, a polarising effect. So um, if that trend continues, I think you can expect even more cases to run. But 
I, I do see this shared dynamic and shared ownership as a really um, productive development. And um, I wouldn't say unexpected, but um, uh, very, very positive for both sides of the equation because I think we have restored a sense of balance to this. This is litigation, which is now viewed on its merits on an each and every case basis, as opposed to the automatic reaction being, this needs to be settled. That, that has force. I'm, I'm also noticing that, and although there's tension in what I'm about to say between being quick and efficient and cheap, uh, but also getting a good result um, in settling the matter if it's settlable before trial, but I'm also seeing that as corporate defendants assemble their substantive response, their, their, their lay and expert evidence, um, they, they start to see the pathways towards winning the case uh, and I think their appetite to settle it at that point becomes uh, a, a little bit diminished. And so it's a very, I think that's one challenge for class actions and, and risk in that space. Their four or five or six year exposures in a fair degree of uncertainty and, and to sort of win, you've got to do so much work that the sunk cost by the time you're at that point, almost the trial becomes something worth, worth testing. Um, now, I, I will fulfil my promise of pivoting away from class actions and, and I want to talk shortly about what everyone's talking about, ESG risk. I know that, uh, Kane, in particular, you've been doing a lot of thinking in that space recently. Just before we get into ESG, the, the buckets of ESG risk, let me, let me ask you this. There are, there are perhaps no practitioners closer than you both to what is the pulse of uh, boardrooms around Australia in the way they're seeing risk and what's keeping directors and officers up at night. If you put class actions perhaps to one side, I'll, I'll take it as assumed that's in the list. Um, what, 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 are, what is occupying from a risk perspective, perhaps Paul starting with you, uh, boardrooms and, and what's keeping directors and officers up at night? Well, Jason, if I were on the board of a listed company, um, I think one of the big things that would keep me awake at night is how I oversaw the uh, morass of regulation that, um, that, that governs and at times burdens corporate Australia. And so some of the biggest um, securities class action claims, so going back to that again, uh, are those involving um, contraventions of the um, anti-money laundering counter-terrorism financing legislation and the spectacular corporate fines uh, imposed on two of Australia's biggest banks. Um, and um, and as, as a director, um, I, I would be um, concerned about understanding all of that regulation as it affects the business um, that I was a director of uh, and, and how um, I, I manage that risk and ensure that the executives of the business are managing that risk and reporting to me as a director in an appropriate way. And there's just so much of it, and it seems to be ever increasing. So that, that's one thing that would keep me awake at night. Another thing that would keep me awake at night um, is cyber risk, because that seems to be such a prevalent area of criminal activity with such a capacity to cripple um, businesses uh, in Australia and around the world. Um, and I would be very concerned about understanding that risk, um, how that risk is best to be managed. It's a sage point because ASIC has said, as you know, Paul, that um, over the next five years, cyber security data breach is a, is a critical focus for uh, its objectives and, and where ASIC goes, generally the private litigation will also follow. So uh, it resonates completely. Kane, how about you? What, what's, uh, what's causing sleepless nights? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Paul's observations. I think there's also um, this, this grappling with this ever ballooning um, set of responsibilities and interests. So um, this discussion around um, stakeholder interests and how stakeholder interests um, interact with the best interests of our company. Um, often um, for directors, it, it's difficult to reconcile individual stakeholder interests. Um, yes, um, that all has to be resolved by reference to the best interests of the company as a whole, but that's easy at a principled level very, very difficult at, um, at a day-to-day at you know, -day, um, level where there's far more intense scrutiny, um, there's far more active stakeholders than ever was. And so um, instead of being a director whose primary interest is to um, facilitate a, a profitable enterprise, that process now has long and short term. It has um, 
a, a diverse array of stakeholder interests, far more complex than we would have contemplated 10 years ago. And it's not to say that they shouldn't have been considered, it's just that now there's a consciousness and, a, and an acute awareness of, of how to balance that. But you combine this morass of regulation with this evolution of director's duties, um, that is a, it's an incredibly onerous process. Um, and it's not surprising that you have people like David Gonski talking about um, um, really talented candidates not wanting to be on boards. I mean, th this is now, it's, it's an incredible process and it's, as I say, it's very, very onerous. That is a nice segue into uh, a, a broader area, which in hindsight, perhaps we should have had an entire episode devoted to, which is the, the, the catchphrase ESG risk. And um, I did want to talk to you about, obviously the biggest challenge in the globe at the moment is client change. And I think the legal system's trying to catch up to how it will uh, identify and define the boundaries of risk in that space. And I want to keep the questions around ESG general for you both because I want you to cherry pick what you see as the most significant areas of ESG risk for, for regulation and litigation going forward. But let me frame it in this way. Obviously, we're moving to a lower, a low carbon economy. Obviously, listed Australian entities are going to be making disclosures about how they will achieve that or the targets that they'll set for that. We have, I think, legislation being debated now as we're recording this about a, a national target that might give some policy certainty. We also have a consumer base that wants to know whether products and services are, are green friendly and associated claims of greenwashing. I've rarely seen a, de a debate about risk, you know, get, get so much momentum and prominence. I wanted to ask you both, Kane, starting with you, in that enormous landscape of risk. What do you see as the interesting aspects for, for the future of, of regulation and litigation? The first is this wave of, um, I've described as public interest activism. The reality is it's shareholder activism with a, a public interest focus where um, litigation is used as a vehicle to affect change, not as we've been um, accustomed to, um, recover loss. Um, it's a complete change to um, the landscape and it means that the way we advise on a deal with disputes and the way directors and boards respond to those disputes um, is entirely different. Um, it's a new dynamic. Um, from an insurance perspective, um, it raises questions about fitness for purpose of some of the products that, that are being purchased. But I, I see that as um, it's a fascinating development and it's going to have um, huge challenges um, because it is new and um, the goals are entirely different. Um, the name and shame um, uh, you know, basis, I think, for, for some of this litigation or most of this litigation, um, it has a very personal element to it as well. So um, it's, it's completely changed uh, the litigation landscape in that sense. Now, in saying that, this is not a lot of litigation, it's just very significant. What it does mean is um, I think the central risk that needs to be grappled with is what I would call statement risk. And it's um, ensuring that statements are not made um, to appease or to placate, that they're made because um, they're in the best interest of the company and they're supported by reasoned thinking, you know, verifiable data, um, deep analysis, and ultimately um, they will stand up to scrutiny. That's both at the time they are made and then once that statement is made, there has to be a review process. If things change, that statement can go from entirely accurate and reasonable to entirely inaccurate and unreasonable. And I think that that is going to be um, a very significant factor because um, we've seen how this landscape changes so rapidly. Um, having a system in place to review those statements and ensure that um, all stakeholders are properly informed, I think that is a massive challenge um, and, and we will see that play out. And Paul, how do we grapple with this uh, ever-changing ESG landscape? What, what's your observations of what's most interesting there? Yeah, Jason, I think it's, it's a very difficult thing to grapple with. Um, there's a, um, uh, as you, you'd know, there, there's a very prominent um, Sydney Silk um, Noel Hutley SC, and in um, 2016, 
um, Noel was commissioned by a, a, a public interest governance um, group um, to write an advice on the duties of directors um, in relation uh, to climate change. And um, that advice um, is available um, on the internet. You can download it, it's, it, it's a public service. Um, and, and I think it's well worth reading for, for any director uh, or officer um, uh, of a listed entity. Um, and um, in that advice, one of the things that um, Noel Huckley says is that as of 2016, there had been no uh, climate change um, litigation as such in Australia, um, as opposed to the rest of the world. Well, that's changed now. Uh, and um, I think it's got a long way to go uh, before we can really get a handle on its size or its dimension, um, and how it might best be managed. Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head in terms of what might be the most immediate next risk, which is, you know, let's assume we're in a context where there are mandates, legislative mandates for, for emissions, for example, uh, not just in the extractive industry, we're gonna have a range of entities disclosing how they're gonna get there, what their, what their carbon footprint is, what their green impact is. And as we all know, traditional rules apply. You need to have a reasonable basis for that. And if you don't, you can be the, the subject of a shareholder class action and the, the law is written on that. So let's watch to see if, if uh, Noel Hutley's advice and, and, and sort of the, the anatomy that he lays for some of those actions takes hold, but um, it, it feels like that is an area. Class actions expand to, to find new entrepreneurial real estate. It feels as though that's where we're heading next. Last question to you both is the hardest one, I think, to define legally, which is if we're having a conversation five years ago about risk, we, we probably wouldn't talk fundamentally about corporate culture as generating legal risk, or at least it wouldn't be in our top five. Things are moving on. I think post-Royal Commission, you've got culture in the testing of management, reporting transparently sense, but now you've got, am I creating a safe workspace free from harassment and bullying? In a sense, that latter category is almost more uh, directly connected with reputation than, than a shareholder class action and potentially therefore more, more damaging. Uh, uh, general comments about corporate culture and cultural risk and how that might influence the advice you're giving to your clients. Would you like to go first, Kane? <laughs> it's actually, it's a, it's a it's a difficult one because um, I think we all assumed there would be um, more litigation. There would be um, a lot more scrutiny around um, how corporations are addressing those issues. Um, it, it is a sleeping issue, I think, um, and it may be because it's been um, proactively addressed and um, it is actually at the forefront of most uh, boards' minds. Um, I think it's inevitable we will see um, legislative reform to uh, tackle those sort of cultural issues. There will be personal liabilities attaching to, um, to officers in respect of um, guaranteeing safe workplaces outside of the traditional personal injury area. Um, but, but it has been an issue, I think, which hasn't been aired as much as it ought to have, um, given what we know about problems in that space and the huge um, issues that need to be tackled. So I am surprised and I think um, it, it's probably a watch this space in terms of um, how those issues are addressed as part of the broader discussion, which at the moment I think climate change is probably has it in the shadow um, uh, and, and probably unfairly. And, and Paul? Well, Jason, I think it's very interesting to see how social trends um, that develop generally in society can have an impact on um, corporations um, and on corporate governance and then on, um, on litigation, um, on claims, on losses, on risk and on insurance. Uh, and this seems to be an area, um, again, it's, I, I think we're, we're at the beginning of a curve. Quite where that curve will go, I don't know. And whether there are um, risk products in the market that can be purchased to assist corporates to abate that risk, um, uh, I'm not so sure. So there's the traditional um, employment practices liability policy um, that's been around for a long time, and that's a good product, um, but whether it would pick up all the sorts of risks that this sort of um, trend um, uh, might, might, might bring um, is another matter. So that creates, um, I think, um, uh, consequences, concerns, but also opportunities for people um, who are in the business professionally, 
of pricing risk um, and offering products to, to abate risk. Paul and Kane, our audience will get so much out of uh, that interaction today and the benefit of your experience. Can I just express my sincere thanks for you joining this episode of On Just Terms? It really means a lot. Well, it's a pleasure. Thanks, Joseph. You have been listening to a podcast brought to you by Herbert Smith Freehills. For more episodes, please go to our channel on iTunes, Spotify or SoundCloud and visit our website, herbertsmithfreehills.com for more insights relevant to your business.